So we come to our second session, brethren and sisters, dealing with the example of the patriarchs in the matter of prayer. And we're going to have not much time, of course, to do to, to anything other than just pick a couple of instances out of the life of the patriarchs. We're going to start with Abraham, of course. That's where you would start, wouldn't you, Abraham? And Abraham, three times in the Word of God, is called the friend of God. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 7. We'll be coming to Second Chronicles 20 later on in our studies. Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 8. And James chapter 2 and verse 23. So three times he's called the friend of God. True friends have confidence in one another and regularly communicate. Revelation and prayer were critical in the relationship between Yahweh and Abraham as we read in Genesis 18. So come back to the book of Genesis. Firstly, Genesis 18. And we're going to then go to have a look at Genesis chapter 15 <coughs> briefly. Genesis 18, of course, is the time when, when Sodom and Gomorrah are about to be destroyed. And the angels have gone off to do that work and to rescue Lot and his family. And we believe it's Michael the archangel who remains behind with Abraham in Genesis chapter 18 because it says in verse 22 that he stood yet before Yahweh. So this was Yahweh's personal representative, Michael the archangel. And this is what we read about Abraham from verse 17 onwards. The angel said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of Yahweh to do justice and judgment, that Yahweh may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. So Abraham had a relationship with Almighty God. It was a relationship of confidence. Abraham had confidence in God. God had confidence in Abraham. That, of course, means that they were truly friends. Now, wouldn't it be a lovely thing if at the judgment seat, the angel that has a role in our lives and records our lives and will be the one who goes through the record before we appear before Christ in judgment. Wouldn't it be a lovely thing if during the conversation he said, you are a true friend of Yahweh, the God of Israel. Wouldn't that be terrific? Well, you know, Daniel had that said to him in, in Daniel chapter 10. He was told, he went through that, that typical death and resurrection and judgment and immortalization in Daniel 10, right at the end of his life, he was told, Fear not, you are dearly beloved of Almighty God. All right? You're a friend of God. So it can happen. We can be friends of God. We make that choice. But we have to build that relationship with him. True friends do not conceal from each other matters important to the fulfillment of God's purpose in their lives and the lives of others. Confidence is born of observation of attitude and behaviour over a period of time and the experience of trial. The development of such a friendship always has an ultimate goal. So that's what happens here with Abraham. God is going to work with this man to bring him ultimately to the kingdom as the father of the faithful, the leader of many others, so to speak, in faith. So let's have a look at what God does with Abraham. It's fascinating to see the way God works with this man to improve him in terms of prayer. So let's just step back to Genesis 15. Now again, this is a familiar chapter. This follows, of course, Abraham's victory over Kedileoma in the northern confederacy. He's meeting with Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18, where Melchizedek brings out bread and wine. His, his oath to Yahweh, we will see that in a minute, his oath to Yahweh, uh, in the presence of the king of Sodom, whom he rejects. Okay, all of that precedes this. And he has reason to fear, because he's got the remnants of Kedileoma's host. He's got the king of Sodom, who's been repudiated. He take kindly to that. So he's fearful of certain things. That's why we read in verse 1 of Genesis 15. After these things, that's the things of chapter 14. The word of Yahweh came unto Abraham. Now, something important happens here that we haven't seen before in the word of God. 
To be sure, we're only 15 chapters into the Bible. But the first time we read of the word of Yahweh is here in Genesis 15. And it's there twice. You might want to highlight that in verse 1. After these things, the word of Yahweh came unto him. First time you read that phrase in the word of God. And then you have in verse 4, And behold, the word of Yahweh came unto him. So you see, we pointed out in our first study the importance of the word of God in relation to prayer. And of course it's obviously important in relation to the building of faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, says Romans 10 verse 17. So how does God set about this matter of improving Abraham in prayer? Well, verse 2, Abraham said, because he's just heard that he's, he's got God as his protector, I'm thy shield and thy great, exceeding great reward. He says, Adonai Yahweh, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. I picked up this guy when I came through Damascus. Is he my heir? I want you to notice something. Don't you reckon that's a reasonable request? God doesn't answer it. Did you notice that in your Bible? God doesn't answer it. Because the next verse, verse 3, says, And Abram said, but that's how verse 2 began, isn't it? So what that means is that he prays, but he gets no answer. So why doesn't God answer? Well, he wants to see whether or not this is genuine, this is sincere. He's teaching Abram a very important principle he wants to teach us. You're not always going to get an immediate answer to prayer. Because it may not be the best thing for you at the time. Okay? God might wait. He might wait for various reasons. And he waits here to see what Abraham's response will be. Because he wants to teach him the importance of persistence in prayer. So Abraham said again in verse 3, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine, which is exactly what he said in the previous verse. Okay? So he's asked the same thing again in different words. God is teaching him something. Very important. So this is what we say on the screen here. It's important to note that Abram is the one who speaks twice here. Yahweh doesn't speak. This indicates an immediate answer to prayer was not forthcoming. This is God's method. He wants to see faith and persistence in prayer as the mark of trust and dependence. So similarly, we must learn to be patient and persistent in prayer. Now the next test for Abraham was an answer to his prayer that seemed impossible from a human perspective. And this is the way God works, isn't it? He doesn't answer for a while, but when you get an answer, you think, that's ridiculous. I mean, he says to him in verse 5, he says uh, in verse 5, he brought him forth abroad, so he brings him out under the stars and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars if they'll be able to number them, so shall thy seed be. And Abraham, we know, believed God, believed in Yahweh. He believed that nothing was too hard for God. But it was impossible. I mean, he didn't even have a son, leave alone a multitude that came from his loins that were innumerable. Okay? That was an impossibility from a human standpoint. But he believed it. See, so here's God's method. He, he gives something that's beyond your expectations. You know, oh, wow. So, there's a lesson in that for you and me, is there not? As I said, in the case of Abraham's servant in Genesis 24, he could hardly believe, because he hasn't even finished his prayer. And Rebecca is there. This is exactly what he's asking for. And so he, he wondered whether that's an answer to prayer. So it's actually building faith and confidence in us. It's not given to you on a platter. Otherwise, we wouldn't be any better off. So Abraham is tested in prayer. He brings him forth. Firstly by delay, and then by promising this unlikely outcome. Far exceeds his expectations. Now, Brother Carter makes a very interesting comment in this context. He's actually talking here about Abraham's meeting with Melchizedek. And if you just cast your eyes to chapter 14, and at verse 22, this is what we read. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, who's offering him all the goods, I have lifted up mine hand unto Yahweh, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, and I will not take from you anything. It's clear, says Brother Carter, 
from Abraham's words that in the worship of God in company with Melchizedek, Abraham had made a solemn dedication of service to God. Some intimate words had passed between priest and worshipper, and some great resolve registered. The meeting had set Abraham's course and had given him the moral earnestness to follow it. So just that little glimpse from the life of Abraham is very instructive for you and me. That, you know, when, when a man sets his heart to serve his God, as Abraham did in the presence of Melchizedek, he makes a vow, like we make in baptism, sets his heart to serve his God. It's the beginning of a process of building a relationship, a very close relationship with the Almighty, who can't be seen with the nat natural eye, but can be seen with the eye of faith. And that a friendship can develop there. That God can make a declaration three times in the word. Abraham is my friend. Now that's not something that can be just unique to him. We too can become the friends of our God. If we have this kind of confidence in the friend that we have in heaven. Now we don't want to belittle God in any way. But friendship between almighty God and man is possible. Okay. That's a wonderful thing that we learn from the life of Abraham. Now that's pretty short, isn't it? I could do a lot more on Abraham, but I want to spend a bit of time on Isaac, and you're going to be surprised by the course that I take you on uh, as we look at Isaac in, in relation to prayer. We're going to have a look at the end of Genesis 24. Now, I've, I've, I've mentioned this chapter a couple of times already. This is where Abraham's servant was sent away to find a wife for Isaac. And uh, <coughs> Rebecca was brought back. She's a, a faithful uh, young girl. She might have been, we don't know how young she was, but she wasn't all that old, that's for sure. So she, she comes back to marry Isaac. So where's Isaac when she arrives? And there's a big long journey that's, that's been undertaken to get her back. And we read in verse 61 that she arose and she went with Abraham's servant. And in verse 62 of Genesis 24, we read, And Isaac came from the way of the well lahai Roi, for he dwelt in the south country. Now this name, lahai Roi, only occurs three times in the Word of God and the rule in Genesis. And I want to show you all three, and I want to show you why it's important in relation to prayer. Because this well... Lahairoa is intimately connected with the allegory of Hagar and Ishmael and Sarah and Isaac. It was actually named by Hagar after the appearance of an angel telling her to go back and to submit to Sarah, or Sarai, as she was known then. And the promise concerning Ishmael, the son that was to be born to her through Abraham, set forth the character of Abraham's natural seed for generations to come. And it all is involved with this matter of prayer. So let's come back and have a look where this place is named. Come back to Genesis chapter 16. Now you would expect that you're going to get something that will make your brain cells work a little bit, and that's what you're going to get for the next 15 minutes or so. Okay? Now what we probably need to do, if you are dexterous, is you need to have Genesis 16 open, but you might want to put something, a piece of paper or something, <coughs> into Galatians chapter 4. <coughs> because Galatians chapter 4 is the explanation by Paul of what these events that occur in Genesis 16 are all about. What they really mean. And that's what we want to know. We want to know what they really mean. So let's explore that. Now Galatians 4, if you just pick it up with me from verse 22, <coughs> says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, that's Hagar, we're going to read about her in a minute in Genesis 16, the other by a free woman, that's Sarai, his half-sister and wife. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he who was of the free woman was by promise. Which things, he says in verse 24, are an allegory? So what is this allegory? Well, he says, he tells us, he says in verse 24 of Galatians 4, 
For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which means this is about the delivery of the law of Moses at Mount Sinai when Israel was there for, for 12 months. They, got, they received the law of Moses. So the one from Mount Sinai which gendereth to bondage because law held the Jews in bondage. They couldn't keep it so it was, they were in bondage to it which is Hagar. And it says A-G-A-R. It's Hagar. Okay. And then we read this, verse 25. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem which now is and is in bondage with her children. So he's talking about the Jews who were living at that time. Right, the time of Christ and the time of Paul were still living under law. They could have escaped and come into Christ, but they're living under law. They're in bondage. Now these Galatians had come out of law. Many of them, Jews had come out of law, come into Christ, been baptised into Christ. Okay? But some of them wanted to go back to it. And he says, that's ridiculous. Don't you understand the allegory? So it's important we understand the allegory. And of course, the Jerusalem from above, verse 26 is free, which is the mother of us all. In other words, Sarah represents the Abrahamic covenant. Okay? So you come into Christ by baptism, you come into the Abrahamic covenant. You're actually, you've got a mother. All right? Your mother is Sarah or Zion. And we can prove that from Isaiah 51. But anyway, we won't do that now. Got a bit of a feel? Okay, let's go back to Genesis 16. So the angel finds Hagar out in the wilderness near a well. She's in strife. She's with child. She's run away because Sarai has rightly put proper pressure on her. She doesn't like it, so she runs away. And in verse 11, the angel says, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael. Ishmael means ale will hear. Because he then says, Because Yahweh hath heard thy affliction. So the boy's going to be named after her problem her affliction. Yahweh's heard it. Then look at verse 12. This is a fascinating verse. And he will be a wild man. Now, we need to stop there, because if you've been looking at the screen, you will see that Rotherham's translation includes the word ass. But he will be a wild ass of a man. That's because in the Hebrew, the word kamor is there. Kamor, C-H-A-M-O-R, means the male ass. And in the word of God, the male ass is always the symbol of the nation of Israel. Natural Israel. Okay? Ishmael, in the allegory, is going to be set forth as the type of all the natural children of Abraham. The Jews. The nation of Israel. See? He's going to be the type of them. Now, in actual fact, Ishmael is the father of the Arab peoples of today. But God's not really interested in that. He's interested in the allegory. He's interested in the story that it tells in relation to his purpose. So let's just follow this through. What do we read about Ishmael as the type of all the natural children of Abraham living under the law of Moses? Well, his hand will be against everyone. Everyone's hand will be against him. Yet in the presence of all his brethren shall he have his habitation. All of those things are very meaningful, as you're going to see. Now, as I said, the name Lahiroi is used three times in Genesis. And it's named here. So let's just follow on. Verse 13. Hagar called the name of Yahweh that spake unto her, Thou, Ael, seest me. Now, she was a bit disturbed by that. You know, she wasn't all that pleased that God saw straight through her. And said an angel. Exactly like those that Christ spoke to who were hypocritical. Alright? They weren't all that pleased that God saw straight through them. So she becomes a type of those living uh, with the law of Moses. It became a shield to keep God out, really, instead of keeping God in. Now God seeth me, for she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? So she's disturbed by this. Wherefore, the well was called beer, beer, Hebrew word means the well, right, a fountain, the well, lahiroi, which actually means the well of the living one, 
my beholder. That's its meaning. Okay. So what we have here is this allegory. A wild man, a wild ass man, the symbol of Israel. His hand against every man's hand. You just stay in Genesis. You might want to make a note of this. You don't have this in your margin, this note. Alongside of verse 12 of Genesis 16. You might want to make a note to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let me read it out to you. It's, a, it's Paul's explanation of the meaning of Genesis 16 verse 12. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 14 and 15. This is what he says. For ye, brethren, he's writing to the believers in Thessalonica and in Macedonia, became the followers of the ecclesias of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. So what about these Jews? Well, he says this. Who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. Right? They're contrary to all men. Now, Paul is explaining what is meant in Genesis 16 and verse 12, when it says, their hand is against every man, and every man's hand is against them. So he's actually explaining what that really means. And he was a sufferer from that. He being a Jew himself, of course, uh, was treated very badly by his own natural Jewish brethren. He shall dwell, it says in Genesis 16 verse 12, in the presence of all his brethren. What does that mean, you think? Do you dwell in the presence of your brethren? Well, of course you do. So it doesn't mean that, does it? What does it mean? Well, it means that they desired to be seen by their brethren. And in Matthew chapter 23 verse 5, Christ says, of the scribes and Pharisees, he says, beware of them. Listen to what they say, because they very often will speak the word of God. Listen, but don't do what they do. Right? Don't follow their example. Because all the things that they do, all their works they do for to be seen of men. It's all about public consumption. They want to dwell in the presence of their brethren. They want to be noted for something. In the presence of their brethren. Well, guess how, guess how Ishmael dies. We'll see it in a minute. Genesis 25, verse 18, he dies in the presence of all his brethren. But before we get there, let's have a look at the naming of this place. Thou God seest me. So she names it, the well of the living one, my beholder. So Hagar represents the law of Moses in the allegory of Galatians 4.24. The perplexity refers to the discomfort that law presents to those living under it, because you can't keep it, it's going to condemn you. As Paul noted, the law exposed his sinfulness and emphasised his failings in Romans chapter 7. All it did was make it very clear he had a problem, a big problem. Okay. So, here we've got this allegory setting forth those things way back here in Genesis chapter 16. Of course, it's followed through in Genesis 17. One final thing. When this place was named Beer Lahairoi, we read something about it. Look at verse 14 of Genesis 16. Behold. Do we want to behold it? It is between Kadesh and Bered. Kadesh means the sanctuary. Or the holy place. And Bered means hail. Have a look at hail one day in the word of God. Guess what you'll find? Every time that hail is referred to in the Bible, it's in relation to divine judgment. Okay. every time so what we have is something that goes from a sanctuary or a holy place to judgment law delivers judgment living in God's presence delivers life if there is a sanctuary with a man and a woman a sanctuary where they have a relationship with God it leads to life living under law leads to doom because you can't. They couldn't keep the law. It condemned them to death. Even condemned Christ. All right? He hung upon a tree. It condemned him as well. Through no fault of his own. So I want you to come back now with, with me to Genesis 24 and verse 62. We've got our background. We know how this place was named. We know in what context it was named. 
What was happening here in Genesis 24? Well, we read verse 61, or portion of it, and portion of verse 62. It says, And Isaac came from the way of the well, Lahairoi. This is the one that Hagar named. For he dwelt in the south country, the Negev. And then the next verse says, interestingly enough, And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide. So the reason he went out there was to meditate. Now, he wasn't just doing normal meditation. Because this word in the Hebrew, and you can see it on the screen here, this word meditate is the Hebrew word suak. You will not find it anywhere else in the Old Testament. It's just used here. It means to meditate, but more than that, it means to muse or to commune, to speak. It actually has the idea of musing pensively. Okay, so this is actually, as the margin of my Bible says, sorrowful meditation. This is, a, this is a man who's got a heavy heart. And he, he's gone out to this place every day in the evening to sorrowfully meditate about the loss of his mother, Sarah. She died three years before. And three years later, he was still heavy of heart at the loss of his mother. Okay, Remarkable man is this Isaac. And then all of a sudden he gets the answer. Right. He gets the answer. Because you see, as we say in the yellow here, what he does, if you had looked down at verse 67 of Genesis 24, And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother Sarah's death. Okay. So he gets comfort finally. Now this has got huge implications. This is why we spend a little bit of time on the allegory. Who does Sarah represent? The Abrahamic promises. She's also aligned with Zion. And Zion has children through the Abrahamic promises. You and me. When we get baptised, we get baptised in our belief and confidence in the, in the promises that God made to Abraham. Okay? And we know they're going to be fulfilled. And Sarah becomes our mother. Right, she's the mother of us all. That's why, that's why it says in Psalm 87 that when Yahweh writes up the people in the day of judgment, it shall be said of this man and that man, they were born in Zion. I wasn't born in Zion. Were you? No. But you were. If you're baptised on, on the basis of your faith and conviction in the Abrahamic promises, and you're baptised into Christ, you were born in Zion. Sarah is your mother. Okay. That's why that allegory is so important. So you see what's happening here? Where would you take your new wife? Well, you'd probably hire a motel room somewhere far distant from your family, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Of course you would. Where does he take her? Into his own tent? No. Into Sarah's tent. Okay. Yeah, because he's going to have children by Rebecca. And these are the children of Zion. They represent you and me. The seed that would come from Abraham. Okay? That's what it represents. So that's why we say here, for three years his heartfelt prayer had clearly had been involved. Isaac would have, have prayed that the mission of Abraham's servant would be subject to providence, and it was, and divine blessing, and it was. He brings back Rebekah. The answer to his prayers had very personal benefits and far-reaching implications for God's people of all ages who are Sarah's, Sarah or Zion's children, were foreseen in the parable. Okay? That's why it's so important that he took her into Sarah's tent, because that represents all the children that would come out of the Abrahamic promises. Marvellous things, isn't it, when you, when you see the way that that's couched. But see how important prayer was here? How long did he have to wait? How long was he praying? Uh, sorrowfully. Three years? Yeah. Every day. And why did he go to this place? Why would you go to a place called Lahai Roi, do you think? Well, because he actually wanted to be in the presence of God. It means the well of the living one, my beholder. He wanted to be in the presence of God. So there's the proper attitude when it comes to prayer. But there's a sequel to this. And the sequel is in Genesis 25. 
So after Abraham sent his sons by Keturah, so when Sarah died he marries Keturah, he has a family. He sent them eastward across the Jordan to evangelise the land of us. Okay, now, he didn't kick them out of the house because they were not behaving themselves. He wanted Isaac alone to be the one through whom the promises would come, and that was right. So he says to his sons, look, I don't want any problems here, so why don't you go across the Jordan to the land of us and do some work? Now, I'm paraphrasing, I'm telling you what clearly happened, because this is where Job and his three friends came from. They came from ecclesias. When Job's friends came, they didn't come from the same place. They came from different ecclesias. They were people that had proper ecclesias established. So where did they come from? Well, more than likely, almost certainly, from Abraham's children, his sons that were sent across the Jordan uh, to spread the truth, so to speak, uh, into that part of the world. Okay. So what happens then? Well, Abraham dies, doesn't he? Look at verse 11. And it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt by the well Lahiroa. What do you do? You need to know that. Not really. So why does the Spirit put it in there? Well, because it wants you to know the quality of this man. This man was a man of prayer. He wanted to be in the presence of God. He, he wasn't going to run away. You know what Christ says in John three? He says men love darkness because their deeds are evil. They don't want to come to the light, do they? You come to the light, it exposes you. So men love darkness. They want to be in their closets and in their dark world. They don't want to come to be seen by God. They are seen, but, but they don't want to. This man wants to. This man wants to be in the presence of the living one, his beholder. He, he's not uncomfortable like Hagar was. Well, what about Ishmael, her son? Well, he makes an appearance here too. Okay? very strong appearance. Before I go on to Jacob, just let me point out verse 18 of Genesis 25. This is about Ishmael, who, and by the way, this is long before he actually died, so it's actually squeezed into this record for a purpose. It says in verse 18, They dwelt from Havilah to Shur, that is before Egypt, as thou goest toward Assyria, and he, Ishmael, died in the presence of his brethren. He represents all those living under law. Guess what you get? If, if all you do is to be seen of men, guess what you get? You die. In the, that's all you get. In the presence of your brethren. Unfortunately, those who rejected the judgment seat were pushed away and they'll have seen their brethren go into immortality. You know, they'll see them made immortal and then they're pushed away. So there's your contrast between the two outcomes. Now I'm going to conclude this session here on the patriarchs by taking you to a couple of incidents in the life of Jacob okay so let's let's have a look at Genesis 28 first of all a bit further on in Genesis now we're all familiar I think with the the, the critical importance of the events that happened at Bethel named Luz before in Genesis 28 uh, Jacob was in danger of being killed by his brother Esau because he had stolen not only his birthright but his blessing uh, in Genesis 27 and uh, it was clear he had to leave so Isaac in faith sends him off to Haran to find a wife that the promises to Abraham might be you know, continued through Jacob so we're familiar with the story and we know of course what happened to him he comes to this place and he takes a stone to make it a pillow, which of course might be quite uncomfortable, but anyway, he takes a stone and makes it a pillow. And in verse 12, we read this. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder, it actually means a staircase. A staircase, it says in the King James, set up on earth, it actually should read, planted earthwards. That's what the Hebrew really means, planted earthwards. So, you know, most stairs, well, all staircases today, do they not have to have a foundation? I mean, we wouldn't walk on that staircase if it wasn't on a solid foundation. This one didn't have a foundation on earth. It was extended from heaven. Okay, It was extended from God, earthwards. And angels were ascending and descending. Now, why 
ascending first, do you think? Well, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? They were already with Jacob. God had already sent them to Jacob. So they were ascending and then coming back, ascending and descending upon him. It was God's message to him. And we know the importance of this in John 1.51. When Christ encounters Nathanael, he says, Behold! And this has relevance to what I'm going to say. An Israelite indeed. Now Jacob's name has changed from Jacob, heel catcher, to Israel, prevailer with God. Okay? Nathaniel had gone along the path from becoming a hill catcher to becoming a prevailer with God. Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. Jacob, of course, had guile and had to be removed from him. And Christ says to Nathaniel, who's, who marvels, he says, how do you know me? Uh, when I was under the fig tree, he says, well, I knew you were there. He says, you're going to see greater things than this. You're going to see the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. That's all about the building of the Ecclesia. All about the building of the Ecclesia. Now all of that's here in Genesis 28. Because this stone that he uses as a pillow, he props it up in the morning after getting seeing this dream and receiving the promise. He props it up on its end. Look at verse 18 of Genesis 28. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had used for his pillow. You can cross the word S off. It's only singular in the Hebrew. And set it up for a pillar. So a pillow becomes a pillar. All right? Props it up on the end. And then he pours oil on it. Why is that important? Well, because you see, this is all picked up by the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 3. So how's your dexterity? Can you, can you have a hand in Genesis 28? Very quickly flick over to 1 Timothy 3. First Timothy 3 is all about the, the uh, selection of appropriately qualified brethren for ecclesial roles. That's the early part of the chapter. Also demonstrates that whether they be, whether they be in the forefront as overseers or servants, ministers, called deacons here, they have to have good wives, okay? So... You have to have good wives. Let me read this in verse 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. We all know what Bethel means, don't you? I'm just going to read to you what Jacob says about it. Uh, in Genesis 28, verse 17, he says, And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? It, it, not dreadful in the sense of terrible, but awe-inspiring. Right. How awe-inspiring is this place? This is none other, he says, but the house of God. That's what Bethel means. So when Paul picks up this language, he's actually back in Genesis 28. His mind is back in Genesis 28. But thou mayest know how thou oughtest behave thyself in the house of God, Bethel, which is the ecclesia of living God. There's no article before the word the, the, the word that's not there before the word living okay so it's an ecclesia of living God that is people framed in their character and their activity like God so when you see them you think oh there's yeah, they're clearly they're clearly from God it's an ecclesia of living God then it says this the pillar and ground of the truth so he's obviously taking this language from Genesis 28 the pillar and ground of the truth. And by the way, that, that phrase, the ground of the truth, in the, in the Greek of the New Testament, that word ground is hedrioma. It actually means a habitation of mighty ones, which is what the ecclesia should be, shouldn't it? It should be a habitation of mighty ones being prepared for the kingdom age. So there's Paul's insight on this. So Bethel, verse 19 of Genesis 28, tells us you can come back there now, means the house of God. Prefigures... A place of mighty ones. So prayer incorporating a vow of commitment is important for all the seekers. That's exactly what follows. Have a look here in Genesis 28. This is all about the development of the ecclesia. 
because he's going off to find a wife so that there can be children to Abraham. And there's 12 sons come from Jacob. And out of that comes Israel. All that that means, of course, for you and me. It's all about the development of the ecclesia of old and of the present. And we read this at the end of Genesis 28, verse 20. He names the place Bethel in verse 19. And then Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be, will be with me and will keep me in, in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall Yahweh be my God. This is not actually a bargain. All right, in the Hebrew, there's no bargain. He's not saying, if God does this, then I will do this. What he's saying is he's confident that God will do that and he's going to respond by doing this. And so he, then he offers up the tenth. Got a picture? So this, this vow comes on the back of these wonderful events in which Jacob is, is exposed to the way God works in the lives of his faithful servants. Let's come to Jacob's prayer at Jabbok, the finest prayer in the longest night of Jacob's life, Genesis chapter 32. Now, some of you will have these little phrases highlighted in your Bible. This phrase that you read in verse 13 of Genesis 32, and he lodged there that same night. You'll see it again. In verse 21 and verse 22. Verse 21 says, So went the present over before him and himself lodged that night in the company. Verse 22. And he rose up that night. He didn't get a wink of sleep. This was the longest night of Jacob's life. But it also contained the greatest of his prayers. But not before he takes out an insurance policy. Okay. In verse 4 of Genesis 32, he commanded them, saying, Thus shall you speak unto my Lord Esau. So he sends off, we believe you can compute, there are five bands of many, many animals. He sends them off in the care of, of, of his servants with a message to Esau. And the message is, you know that, that um, blessing I stole? I don't want it. Okay. Because the blessing of Isaac was all about the present. You know, be thou Lord over thy brethren. Jacob didn't want to be Lord over his brethren. Esau did. So when he sends the message, he says, you say, my Lord Esau. He said, yeah. And what about all these animals? You know, the, the blessing of Isaac, which Jacob stole, wasn't the one he was looking for. It was the wrong one. It was all about the present. It was about the, the fruits of the, of the field. So what does he do? He sends him off the animals and says, here, you can have them. I don't want him. So he abandons the blessing that he stole. Because it wasn't the right one. The one he wanted was the one he got in Genesis 28. Right. The blessing of faith that Paul talks about in Hebrews 11.20. Okay. That's another subject, but you got the idea. So what he's doing here is taking out an insurance policy. And then he prays. It would have been far better if he prayed and then took out the insurance policy. Okay. But the human beings, we, we, our automatic reaction is, uh, what can I do to save myself? Not go to the Father who can save you. That's our normal human reaction. So Jacob's there to represent you and me. He <coughs> takes out his insurance policy before prayer. But it doesn't really solve the problem, does it? Look at verse 7. He's still not confident. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, it says in verse 7, and he divided the people that were with him. You never do that. That, that, is, that, that is the worst policy you can adopt. Divide those who are with you. I mean, if you've got people that are with you, and you know what I mean in the sense of that, if people are with you, then you don't divide them. You stick with them. Okay. So there's a principle in that as well. Okay. This, is the, this is what's called in Jeremiah 30 and verse 7, the time of Jacob's trouble. But we are told... In Jeremiah 31, verse 11, in the dream of Jeremiah, that he was going to be, he was delivered out of it. God saved him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Why? That's the, that's the question. Why? Well, because of the prayer. The prayer. Now, that prayer you see in verses 9 to 12. 
I'm going to read it before I take you to our last place today in this session in Hosea 12. Because Hosea 12 is a commentary on this chapter, Genesis 32. As you can see, these events were designed to remove from Jacob his tendency to self-reliance, a very human characteristic implied by the meaning of his name. So Jacob, he'll catch you. Get his hand on Esau's heel when he's born. God's trying to get that hand off. It takes him 147 years to get it off Esau's heel, so to speak. Okay? And he has to become Israel. Now, we'll explain what the name Israel meant when we get to Hosea 12. And we'll see how important this is. But let's just read this prayer of desperation here. Even after his marvellous prayer of desperation in verses 9 to 12 of Genesis 28, Jacob continues to plot his own path of redemption from the hand of his brother. He hasn't got to that point yet of, yet of full reliance upon God. It doesn't mean we don't do anything. We've got to do things. We've got to do them in the right order. So let's just read this prayer in verses 9 to 12 of Genesis 32. And Jacob said, and look, look at the content of this. O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, Yahweh which saidst unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. I am not worthy of the least, of all the mercies. And that word there, as Kay said, is the word that God uses of his own characteristic of grace and mercy in Exodus 34, verse 6. And of all the truth, that's, that's emeth, that's the word God uses in Exodus 34, 6, of his characteristic of faithfulness and loyalty, stability, which thou hast showed unto thy servant, for with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I have become two bands. And this is the request. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the, and the mother uh, uh, with or over the children, as it's the mother trying to protect the children, and both of them killed. And thou saidst, I will surely do thee good, and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Okay, Wonderful prayer. In actual fact, it's got all the framework. The framework of the Lord's Prayer is there. Okay? So, it's, it's a wonderful prayer. But he has a problem. What's his problem? Come to Genesis 32, verse 20. He fears the face of Esau. He needs to be looking into another face. And he's going to do that very shortly because he's going to come face to face with the angel of God in verse 24 but look at verse 20 this is his problem this is what he tells his servants to pass on to Esau and say ye moreover behold thy servant Jacob is behind us for he said now this is what he said this is how his brain is thinking now what I've done for you on the screen here is I've, I've paraphrased this a little but I've actually put the meanings the Hebrew words and their meaning in here and the, the thing that comes out is that he uses this word kafar, which means uh, to, to, uh, to cover a, a couple of times, and he uses this word penny four times. Okay? Penny means the face. So this is how it should read. For he said, I will cover his face, really, with the present that goes before my face. And afterward, we'll see his face. Peradventure he will accept my face. Jacob, don't worry about the face of Esau. What you need to do is to look into the face of God. So in verse 24 what happens? And Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him. Notice it's the angel who starts the wrestling. Right? Not Jacob. It's the angel that starts the wrestling. There, and a man wrestled. The reason it says a man is not not because it was a man, but because you see the lesson is not just for Jacob. You've got to see in a minute from Hosea 12. The lesson of this is for you and me. And what is the lesson? God wrestles in our life by our relationships with men. So I had to work for Pharaoh for 43 years. okay, And I struck many different people in that time, some of whom I could have quite, if I was not a Christadelphian, I could have strangled them. Okay, the way they behaved. So I had to deal with all sorts of people. In ecclesial life, you deal with all sorts of people. Right? In family life, you deal with people. It's there, brothers and sisters, 
that we're tested. It's there that we're purged. It's there in the experiences of life, everyday life, that God is wrestling with us. Not we, with him. He's wrestling with us. He's trying to take us from a Jacob, a heel catcher, a self-dependent, self-reliant person, to a totally dependent prevailer with God. That's what he's trying to do. So what happens to Jacob, he's trying to do in our lives. And we, we, we tend to be resistant. You know, we, we don't get it. And we need to get it, because this is where we have to go. The face he really needed to see was the face of the angel. And that was soon to come. Look at verse 30. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen, he says, God face to face. And my life is preserved. That's the face he needed to see. And we know what happens between all that. He's, the angel touches his thigh. It's out of joint. And he's in agony and he's hanging on for a blessing. He's going to wait till the breaking of day, which is what we're going to do. And we're going to wait till the breaking of the dawn of the new day, the millennial day. It's coming. You've got to hang on, looking into the face of Ale. You know, like this. Okay? Close, very close. That's the message here. And it all comes on the back of this marvellous prayer. This is God delivers him. Wonderful things. Now, there's a whole lot more there, but I'm not going to do that because I want to take you to... I want to take you to uh, Hosea 12 shortly. But this is summarise this. Well, the, the prayer we read, a careful analysis of this prayer, spoken in the dark of night under enormous pressure, reveals that it contains all the essential elements of, of effective prayer. The importance of heritage is first mentioned. He mentions Abraham and Isaac, his father, the heritage that he had. As in the Lord's Prayer, our Father which art... That's our heritage, Okay. Jacob hallows, or makes holy, as the word means, Yahweh's name in the process. He mentions that God's will had been done by him returning to the land as instructed. Thy will be done. It had been done. And he acknowledges the divine blessings and acknowledges his unworthiness of them. Okay, so, a wonderful prayer. He prays for deliverance from evil and confesses his worst fears. He finally leans heavily on the promises of God to be fulfilled. So his prayer is a model for all saints of God at all ages. Informative and predictive of the framework, as we said, of the Lord's Prayer. Now, com Scripture comments eloquently about the relevance to us of Jacob's experience over 40 years. And we know that's true. But, you know, when you come to Hosea 12, it's driven home very powerfully. So let's do that. Let's come to Hosea chapter 12. I've been speaking long enough. Let's finish this off now. Hosea 12 mentions Israel in chapter 11 verse 12 and we're going to come back there in a moment what does this name Israel mean? well it consists of two Hebrew words Sarah which means to prevail and Ael which means might or power hence Young says ruling with God and Strong says he will rule God now, really? do men rule God? can men in any way rule God? Well, we're going to talk about that. You know, this is not for babies. This is not for immature. And you've got to treat this with the respect it deserves. Because it's a subject of great profundity, really. So what about this Jacob? Look at verse 3 of chapter 12. He took his brother by the heel in the womb. So he's Jacob, a heel catcher. And by his strength he had power with God. That word power, as you can see, is the word Sarah. It's part of the name Israel. Okay? He had power with God. He prevailed. Young's literal says, by his strength he was a prince with God. He prevailed with God. Look at verse 4. Yeah, he had power over the angel. Different word power in the Hebrew. This is sir. It means to vanquish or to rule. Really? Young's literal says, yea, he is a prince under the messenger. So what's this trying to tell us, brothers and sisters? It's trying to tell us a very important principle that men can actually at times under certain circumstances rule over God and they do that by prayer but a certain kind of prayer you see when you read on in verse 4 it tells you how Jacob prevailed 
How did he prevail? Was it with his physical strength holding on to the angel? No. It tells us. He wept. He wept and he made supplication unto him. That's how he prevailed. Now what's the proof of this? What's the proof that what I'm saying to you is correct? Well, context. Just cast your eye back to chapter 11 and verse 12. So it's not that far away. Chapter 11 of Hosea, verse 12, the last verse of the chapter. It says this. Ephraim compassed me about with lies, and the house of Israel with deceit. But Judah yet ruleth with God, and is faithful with the saints. So Judah is ruling with God. Now that's been rendered variously, as you could expect. Uh, for example, it, uh, it's, it's rendered uh, that Judah prevails. God, see, so how, how's that true? Why is that true? Well, you've just got to take your hand back if you can. Just keep your hand in Hosea 12. Just come back to chapter 1 of Hosea and verse 1. It tells us when Hosea prophesied. Hosea 1 verse 1 says, The word of Yahweh that came unto Hosea, the son of Beri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So we're in chapter 12, near the end of the prophecy. So who, who do you think might be in, sitting on the throne of David now? More than likely Hezekiah. What do you know about Hezekiah? Isaiah comes in. He doesn't have a son. Hasn't married yet. Says, set your house in order. This is in the crisis of the Assyrian invasion. You're going to die. Does God change his mind? He did that though. You're going to die. And Isaiah turns on his heel, walks out, and he hasn't got halfway across the courtyard. And God says to him, turn around, go back, tell him he's going to live for 15 years. I'm going to give him 15 years. Why? Well, because as soon as Isaiah left the room, Hezekiah turned, he was lying on a bed, he was nearly dead. He turned his face to the wall, and he wept. And he made supplication. And God changed his mind. Yeah. That's how men can prevail over God. It's not through human strength or human ingenuity. But prayers like that from genuine servants of God are answered. Okay. So that is what is meant here by the name Israel. And what God's trying to do to you and me is to take us from hill catchers being prevailers with God okay so here it is this clear message from Hosea chapter 11 and verse 12 clearly referring to Hezekiah the king of Judah who fell sick and made that wonderful prayer his weeping as it were changed God's mind and then we have this final comment in Hosea 12 and verse 4 at the end of the verse it says he found him in Bethel that's for the second time and there he spake with us. The lesson is really for us. And what is the lesson? It's in verse 6. Verse 6 says, Therefore turn thou to thy God, keep mercy and judgment, and wait on thy God continually. So mercy and judgment, there's the two ca characteristics of our God. Mercy, Kaseb, judgment, Mishpat in this case, divine justice. So there's the character of God. What does he mean when he says... Wait upon my God. Well, it just so happens that this Hebrew word means to bind together, perhaps by twisting, like an angel and a Jacob. Wrestling. Okay? <laughs> That's the process that God uses continually. It's got to be something that's continual in our life. What a wonderful example Jacob is. In our final session for, the, for today, we're going to have a look at prayer in the time of the kingdom of Israel. We'll have a look bit closer at some of the kings of Judah and their wonderful prayers before their God.